Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Freer and Sackler Gallery. You're a wonderful audience. I have to say I was a bit worried about what was going to happen in August in Washington, but I'm glad to see so many of you have decided to stay in Washington and have a virtual vacation in Cambodia. I think you will be rewarded by that decision. The talk today, uh, I should introduce myself, excuse me, I'm Louise Court, Curator for Ceramics at the Freer and Sackler and co-organizer of the exhibition Gods of Angkor, bronzes from the National Museum of Cambodia together with Paul Jett, who's also here this afternoon. And today we are presenting a lecture in a series um, called Aspects of Angkor, which we selected in order to expand the contextual discussion of Angkor um, around the exhibition, covering things that the exhibition could not cover um, in its own scale. And today's talk is called Divine Dwellings, the Architectural Context of Khmer Sculpture. This is a topic we very much wanted to introduce. Uh, if you've been in the exhibition already, you've probably noticed the large photographic panels that show or suggest uh, the context of stone uh, architecture in which these bronze sculptures were once used. But this talk today will really illuminate that whole topic. And there are few people in the world who are better qualified to present it than our speaker, who is Helen Ibbotson Jessup. Helen, I look at as, upon as the sort of godmother of the Sackler exhibition because she bravely and brilliantly co-organized the 1997 exhibition, a much larger and more exhaustive uh, presentation of Khmer sculptural and architectural traditions at the National Gallery of Washington. We hope that some of you may have seen that. It was the existence or the pre-existence of that exhibition that emboldened us to then focus on a single medium in a much smaller, ex an exhibition of much smaller scale. But it was always with Helen's exhibition in the back of our minds. Helen was, is Australian by birth, but she received her master's and doctoral degrees from the Courtauld Institute in London. She's published a number of books on the topic of Cambodian art and architecture. Uh, including um, not only Millennium of Glory, the National Gallery exhibition, uh, but Masterpieces of the National Museum of Cambodia, published in 2006 by the Friends of Khmer Culture, a group I'll come back to in a minute, and Art and Architecture of Cambodia, a wonderfully compact but illuminating Thames and Hudson publication of 2004. She also, and both of those books are available um, along with the catalog for our exhibition uh, at the table outside the auditorium. So if you would like to get Helen's signature in one of her books, now is the time. Helen has also written on other topics, including uh, the catalog Court Arts of Indonesia in 1990, which was an exhibition that took place in the Sackler Gallery, I'm happy to say. Another very important role that Helen plays is as founding president of the organization Friends of Khmer Culture Incorporated, whose acronym is FOCCI, F-O-K-C-I. This is a charitable organization that does incredibly important support to scholarly and museum and archeological and architectural and restoration conservation projects in Cambodia. Uh, the FOXI uh, funding has reached out to all of those areas and is making possible a lot of very significant work in the country. They've been very supportive of the National Museum and when uh, Paul Jett of our Department of Conservation and Scientific Research was asked to help set up a bronze a metals conservation laboratory in the National Museum, of Cambodia. Uh, FOXI was one of the organizations that contributed significantly to that. And they also contributed to the laboratory after it was set up. 
They, in, in addition, uh, gave funding to this exhibition, particularly so that we could bring uh, the two couriers who escorted the sculptures from Cambodia to Washington for a month-long stay after that duty was done so they could receive additional training in museum procedures. So I highly commend Foxy's activities to you if you're looking for a way to support meaningful work in Cambodia. Uh, among their projects is also the publication of the annual scholarly journal Udaya, and copies of that journal are available for sale outside um, as well. And on a regular basis, they're available in our museum shop. I have one other bit of information about uh, this lecture series, which I'm very happy to announce, and that is that we are putting it up on our YouTube site. And it's been an incredibly successful uh, activity so far. I've received messages from Cambodia and Australia and elsewhere, people saying, oh, I saw the lecture, that's great. So far, the lecture that's on the site is the first one of this series, the one presented by John Guy, or the second one of the series, actually. Um, but we're about to put other lectures up on the site, and uh, Helen Jessup's lecture will be there eventually as well. To reach the site, you go to www.youtube.com slash user slash Freer Sackler. And we also will have links on our own website to that so that you may revisit all the lectures if you wish to um, in, at your leisure. But I'm now very happy to present Helen Jessup to present her talk today, Divine Dwellings, the Architectural Context of Khmer Sculpture. Helen. Thank you so much, Louise, and good afternoon, everybody, on this uh, less hot and steamy day than usual, but anybody who hangs in Washington in August is obviously of heroic stature. This is one of the oldest things uh, in the exhibition that you'll see after this lecture. If you haven't already seen it, you'll have a chance. And it is an indication that the spread of highly sophisticated technical abilities and cultural conceptions had reached Southeast Asia in prehistoric times. We know about the earliest uh, finds in caves, settlements that are part of midden heaps and uh, bone and chipped tool remains. But this kind of sophisticated fabrication uh, was found all over Southeast Asia and some in Cambodia as well. We cannot establish that, however, it was made in Cambodia because we haven't found evidence of uh, the fabrication sites. We do know that a lot of this kind of era bronze work was uh, created in uh, northern Vietnam and perhaps sent out by trade. But what we do know is that its presence in Cambodia or Indonesia or Myanmar or any of the other Southeast Asian regions does indicate the spread and interconnectedness of that era of that area a long time ago. And the Khmer themselves have been around to participate in that for a very long time. Except for Egypt and China, the Khmer have been in place for longer than any other culture or civilization that we know of with any accurate recording. They've been speaking virtually the same language in that same geographical area for about 2,000 years. That means that they were at the nexus of what we know was a highly organized maritime route and sometimes overland route, linking even as far as the Mediterranean, the countries of uh, Asia, starting with China at one pole and ending up in the uh, Mediterranean. We know, therefore, that the diplomatic exchanges were active, not because the Khmer themselves have recorded them, but because the Chinese, who are incomparable record keepers, did so. 
uh, and we have third century records uh, describing uh, an envoy visit from the Wu emperor who reported back that in this place that the Chinese called Funan, which we think was centered in southern Cambodia near Angkor Bore, there were walled palaces, there was an Indian script, there was shipbuilding, and taxes were paid, sometimes in gold, sometimes in gems, sometimes in perfumes. Uh, and in 243, the Khmer ruler returned this uh, gesture by sending gifts of dancers. So Khmer dance, which is depicted on relief sculptures in temples, was clearly a very early uh, component of Cambodian culture. Hydraulic works existed from at least the third century. Highly sophisticated networks of canals linking to each other and linking to the river systems of the Cambodian plain, lots of which is a floodplain of the Mekong and its tributaries. In the sixth century, other Chinese visitors recorded sculpture of gods with many arms, a sure indication, along with the presence of Indian script, that uh, the religions of India, Brahmanism and Buddhism, had already penetrated and were well established uh, in Cambodia. The monuments of Cambodia are a staggering legacy. There are almost 2,000 temples in this smallest of all Southeast Asian nations, except uh, for Singapore, which is, after all, a small island. Uh, it is in land area much smaller than Thailand or Vietnam, but it has this extraordinarily rich uh, legacy. The earliest inscription found in Cambodia itself is dated 611, and it mentions both Indic-sourced gods and Khmer deities, uh, which indicates something that t turned out to be pervasive. That is to say, the ecumenical coexistence of many religions within Cambodia, not only m for most of the history, peaceful coexistence between Brahmanism and Buddhism, but also the acceptance of the ancient Khmer gods, which were somewhat pantheistic, and also the ancestral spirits that are still very potent in current Cambodian belief uh, under the name of Nyak Ta. But the earliest sculpture and the earliest architecture comes rather later. The earliest stone sculpture that we can recall is of the early 7th, perhaps very late 6th century. And it is centered in the region of Angkor Bore, a lot of it on a small hill called Phnom Da, and a lot of it uh, in a monastery called uh, Wat Rum Lok, which was in the modern city, near the modern city of Angkor Bore. Recent excavations have established that Angkor Bore, in fact, had uh, a great wealth of sacred structures in brick, uh, all of which are now ruins but which indicated a fairly sophisticated and highly developed uh, center with, that had, was surrounded by an almost three meter high wall, earthen wall backed with brick. But the earliest structures that we know about are in fact caves. Caves are at the heart of the earliest human adaptation, both as shelter, but also as sacred places. The cave has parallels with the womb and with the tomb, the sacred safe place in the heart of the other great religious symbol, the mountain, which of course is central to many of the world's great religions. So the cave is the first evidence we have of the Cambodians adapting a natural phenomenon to a religious function. And these caves, there are seven of them in all, are on the slopes of Phnom Da. Some of them presumably were original small rock shelters, but they have been hacked out by hand in the manner that the very famous caves in India, Ajanta and Alora, were hacked out uh, from solid stone by hand to form, as it were, uh, temples nurtured in the heart of a mountain. This is the cave uh, as temple. 
On the uh, right, you see an image of Krishna Govardhana, which came from one of these caves. The main cave was preceded by a structure in brick with an entrance gate of standing uh, sandstone slabs, which you see in the left of the screen. And inside that cave, whose wall has been carved to resemble a man-made wall, inside that cave there are niches in the ceiling. Presumably, they were hacking out an area to accommodate very large sculpture without having to go to the trouble of enlarging the entire height of the whole cave. And from these caves, we assume that some point or other in the late 11th, early 12th century, the most important sculpture was removed and placed in a brick temple that was later constructed on top of the hill uh, in where, where the caves are, are situated. On the right, you have another one of the sculptures from Phnom Da. They're all uh, relating to the god Vishnu. Uh, and this is uh, a sculpture of Rama, one of the manifestations of Vishnu. And as you can see, the sculpture has some Indian influences with somewhat aquiline features. Uh, it is also partaking of the very graceful hip swayed uh, position that Indian sculpture adopted at various moments. And it is, of course, very naturalistic and highly graceful. These are very uh, tall, uh, magnificent, noble, uh, spiritual works of art, uh, most of which are housed uh, in the National Museum in Phnom Penh. Terrible things happen. Sometimes there's looting, sometimes there's deliberate destruction, but sometimes there is sheer neglect. And the picture you saw, saw before of the standing doorway into that temple, uh, about two years ago, uh, the stones collapsed. Uh, and what happens if nobody rescues them is that sometimes they get carted away because they make very nice picnic tables and very nice thresholds for your house. So it's very important to keep an eye on everything that looks vulnerable, which is about 95% of, of the temples of Cambodia. Coexisting with this uh, Vishnu cult statuary, a little bit north in Vat Romlok, there were Buddhistic sculptures. Uh, the one on the right you can see in the exhibition upstairs. Uh, it is um, a standing Buddha from Wat Pan Non. And you can see that that same graceful, slender, very spiritual expression uh, is very similar to a stone sculpture, much larger, which comes from Wat Rom Lok uh, in the Angkor Bore region, uh, both uh, of the seventh century. The cave theme turned out to be pervasive for at least another century, and then even longer in architectural adaptation. In the area near Kampot in the south, not too far from uh, Angkor Bore, there's a series of limestone hills. And in these hills are amazing natural caves, limestone caves. And in several of these, the seventh century Khmer created small temples. This one is called, in, in the mountain called Phnom Chingok, is Prasat Phnom Chingok. And it is, as you can see, very pervaded now by stalactites. But in the floor of this temple and of others, there is a stalagmite, which is serving as a linga. So it is a beautiful example of the adaptation of natural elements uh, into uh, a religious structure. The temple is of brick. It has typical features with an arched pediment uh, of the period that would follow very soon uh, with an arched pediment and false stories, apparently three stories in this tiny brick temple. Uh, but inside uh, there is a corbelled, that uh, is stacked uh, cantilevered uh, bricks uh, that are um, creating a single hollow space. Another cave in another hill is Prasa Phnom Kyang, uh, which is a less uh, ambitious uh, little structure, uh, totally now coated with limestone. It looks as if it's been plastered, so it is a natural plastering, you might say, of limestone accretion. Uh, and they are, uh, this one is uh, extremely hard to get into. It's about 30 feet deep down. You have to go down a rather perilous stepladder to get there. And the cave winds back, hence 
the word kyung, which means snail. The ca cave winds back into the hillside with all kinds of mysterious natural formations, which the Khmer felt very strongly were sacred structures in themselves and imbued with spiritual importance. And of course, the cave is still very important. Meditation caves and rock shelters are found throughout all the hills of Cambodia. This one uh, in, on Mount Kulen, uh, it's a meditation cave. Parts of it are carved with figures of meditating Brahmanistic figures and sometimes Buddhistic figures. This is Peng Tbal. Having used natural caves, the Khmer then went on, in the seventh century still, to use the cell as the embodiment of a cave. And there's a whole series, there are seven altogether throughout Cambodia, of cells like this, which are cubic and which have no entrance except for the front uh, door, roofed with a monolith, an extraordinary feat to uh, manipulate those monolithic sandstone slabs, and you can see one on the wall as well, uh, to create an inner sanctum, a quiet, dark place for meditation and the worship of the god, this was once surrounded by another structure. About uh, a meter and a half away from the outer walls of the cell, there was a structure in, permanent, in uh, impermanent materials, uh, long since collapsed. So it is, in fact, a little womb inside the main body of what was a much larger temple. And this theme was explored, as I said, in many other places, uh, including at the beautiful site of Han Che on the Mekong, uh, in the east of Cambodia. This is a rather smaller cell, but as you can see, it has a beautifully carved lintel, which shows Vishnu in reclining sleep, uh, and uh, carved uh, colonnettes uh, that uh, flank the doorway. This also was once surrounded by another structure, as were they all. Far more sophisticated was the treatment given to this temple, also situated on the slopes of, well, a small hill beside uh, Phnom Da, the temple of Ashram Maharose, which is extraordinarily con constructed of basalt, which is a bit of a mystery because there is no basalt for the next about 100 kilometers. It's a sandstone area, as is most of, of Cambodia. And here you see a greater evolution of the false stories, and you can see also that horseshoe pediment that you saw on the little temple inside uh, Phnom Tinhok. Uh, Ashram Maharose, in that form, as I said, is a mystery. It's a long way from Cambodia's basalt region. However, in Cambodia's basalt region, there's a much smaller temple called Prasat Kuk Priyatat in Hanche. And the assumption is that perhaps that temple of Ashram Maharose was dismantled and carried stone by stone that long, long distance and then carted up a steep hill and resurrected. And when the, the temple was reconstructed in the 1930s, the architect discovered that many of the stones in place in the temple as it stands today had been once used in a different place. It's hard to explain without going into rather lengthy detail why this was so, but it was definitely so. So the proof for the possible reconstruction of this temple uh, does exist. This is the site of beautiful Han Che on the Mekong, which is very broad and noble at, at this point uh, in the river's course. Uh, and you can see Prasat Kuk uh, Pretet just nestling on the steep bank. Uh, in the foreground of the picture. It reinforces the importance, of course, of rivers as modes of transport in Cambodia from the earliest days. Uh, the um, statuary from this area is also of remarkable beauty and refinement. Uh, on one side, on your right, you see a stand, a huge, uh, almost two meter tall stone sculpture of Shiva as ascetic in a rather idiosyncratic and somewhat uh, less uh, graceful uh, mode than the earlier Vishnuite sculpture, but evidence that monumental sculpture was being created uh, in these places. The assumption when you're discussing bronzes, you are never quite sure about 
the creation place because they are, for the most part, so readily transportable. But most people who are creating stone sculpture will try to do it in situ because of the obvious practical difficulties of moving it. Uh, on the other side, you have one of the most beautiful and certainly the earliest portrait sculpture in all Cambodia. Both these uh, sculptures are in the National Museum. And uh, this is a, a Devi from Ko Kriang, also on the uh, Mekong, in an area near which once there were a series, of, there were three queens in a row. So this was a very interesting uh, example of the uh, potential role of women as rulers in early Cambodia, something that is not, of, of course, pervasive uh, in many other cultures. She is clearly uh, a portrait. She is highly idiosyncratic and of altogether one of the most humanistic, uh, uh, beneficent uh, sculptures uh, in all the collection in the National Museum. Now, it wasn't just cells that imitated caves or caves being adapted or temples being built in caves, but also the Khmer were building a far more common and pervasive form of temple in the form of a sanctuary tower, which in Cambodia is called a prasat. This is a prasat from another 7th century site further north and to the east, the site that we now call Sambo Prekuk, where uh, in the early 7th century, uh, the King Ishana Varman I created what was obviously a highly sophisticated and highly prosperous uh, civilization. Uh, on the, your uh, left, you see the tower of N11. There are three main groups, central, southern, and northern groups of temples. And altogether, there are more than 200 temples on this site at Sambo Prekuk. And from a tower, not from this one, this is N11, but from a tower nearby, N9, came, uh, everybody has their personal favorite, but this is certainly one of my favorite Khmer sculptures ever created. It's Durga Mahisha Suramardini, who came from N9. She is the, the goddess who was imbued with the strengths and powers of many gods in order to overcome the buffalo demon Mahisha. She is also in the National Museum. At Sambo Prekuk, you have many forms of temple. Mostly it's the prasat form. And occasionally you get one of the more dramatic examples of what happens when the site is neglected. This is N18. Prasat Tre, uh, which as you can see, is entirely supported by an invading luxuriant tropical tree. S11 is another example of uh, a form invented uh, for this site and not found anywhere else in Cambodia. That is the octagonal temple on whose walls were amazing reliefs, all of this in a very beautifully uh, warm-toned uh, brick. And this uh, relief uh, on the right gives us uh, an example of our so-called flying palace and gives us some idea of uh, secular architecture, palace architecture, which, as you can see, uh, comprised uh, columned uh, pavilions, almost certainly, like all secular Cambodian architecture, made of wood. The other form, and this is a great specialty of Cambodia. One has to look to South America to find any other culture that so fervently embraced the idea of the temple mountain. The temple is a microcosm of Mount uh, Meru, the heartland of the Brahmanistic uh, gods. And the temple mountain idea evolved in Cambodia very early. This is Prasat Ak Yom. Once this was enormous, it doesn't look like much now, it's just a lump in the ground. But once it was 100 yards at the base, on three tiers with quite tall towers, and it has a well underneath the central tower that penetrates to the very bottom of the temple and is echoed by a space which is the same as the upper sanctuary space. It's a sort of axis mundi, lim linking the celestial regions with the underworld. We don't know much about the 8th century, which is when Prasat Akyom was constructed. There are very few inscriptions. There's quite a lot of inscriptions from the 7th century, but in the 8th century, fewer. But we do know that it, that was the era when uh, the seat of the chief power source in Cambodia moved to what is now the Angkor region, the Siem Reap area. The queen 
who we know had some influence there, was Jaya Devi, the daughter of Jayavarman I. But at that time, there were 17 named rulers. So there were many, many small states throughout Cambodia at that time. And as I said before, several of them were queens. Little architecture remains there, but there is some sculpture, uh, including um, some bronzes and some stone sculptures. Uh, the um, Avalokiteshvara in the exhibition upstairs on the right of the screen is very similar in stance and in gesture to one that comes from uh, Kompong Luang and to another one that was found, in fact, at Akyom, the small first uh, temple mountain that I showed you. Here you have some more sculpture from that era. You have the Harihara from Tropeng Pong at Rolos, just south of Angkor. You have a Mukalinga from uh, Wat Pometre in Takeo in the south. You have the Linga and Pedestal, which is in the exhibition upstairs, uh, which um, was um, typical of the portable a Shiva shrine that could be moved by the priest uh, as well as being used in a temple. And you have a very large Maitreya of unknown provenance uh, of 32 centimeters high, which is uh, also uh, in the exhibition. And it is of that same fluid, rather humanistic, naturalistic form um, as the sculpture I showed you earlier. On Mount Kulen, we find many, many remains of the earliest of the Angkor settlement temples. The Angkor era is said to begin in 802, which was the date when Jayavarman II was consecrated as universal monarch, or Chakravartin, on the slopes of Mount Kulen, in a temple that we assume was a temple mountain called Rongcheng. Nothing much remains of that at all, but you can see where its footprint was and you can see where some of the um, stone slabs uh, that led to its well uh, still exist and its outer surrounding wall. So it was quite a large temple, but uh, Akyom is, gives us much better evidence of, of the size and style of those earliest temple mountains. Uh, on the left, you have uh, one of the typical stone uh, prasats, like the earlier ones, but much taller and much more ambitious in their structural claims. The, it, it is, in fact, not plastered, although it looks as if it is, but it is an, it, it's a natural accretion. But indeed, once this temple, like all the temples in Cambodia, would have been plastered and also sometimes gilded and certainly painted. So the kind of aesthetic we now think of was not at all the way those temples looked uh, when they were created. Uh, on the right, you have one of three remarkable sculptures of Vishnu in remarkable preservation state, uh, all of them now in the National Museum, that were found in uh, a temple, a series of three temples, uh, just like this one, called uh, Krobe Krap. There were, as I said, many temples, and there are many ruins there, and they all give an indication of the broad extent uh, of the Cambodian uh, power structure that had Angkor as its center. The King Indravarman, who came to the throne in 877, started a settlement near probably where Jayadevi ruled at what we now call Rolos. It's about 18 uh, kilometers south of Angkor. And there he built the first of the monumental, as distinct from merely big, temple mountains that the Khmer attempted. This one was reconstructed uh, also by the French. Uh, its central core, however, had never uh, collapsed. It was very soundly built with lots of laterite in the core in order to aid drainage. It has lasted probably because it is not over ambitious in its angle of ascent. The tower, the Prasad Tower you see at the top is in fact a 12th century edition. It's not part of the original, so we're not entirely sure what used to surmount uh, the topmost temple. Like all Cambodian temples, it was probably not quite finished by the end of the king's reign. He uh, reigned only for 12 years. 
uh, around this temple mountain, whose corners are guarded at the, uh, the sub-cardinal points by monumental elephant sculptures, uh, around it are towers, all of which were representing the eight murti, or aspects of Shiva. And inside these uh, towers were magnificent, large, monumental sculptures. Uh, and the doorways, one open doorway and three false doorways flanked by uh, colonnettes and surmounted by exquisitely carved uh, lintels. Uh, they're flanked by guardian figures, some of them graceful uh, devata, female guardians, and some of them uh, male guardians. Inside these towers were found two uh, very well-surviving sculptures, one of Vishnu, on the left, uh, on the right, sorry, and one of Shiva on the left. Shiva came from Tower 9 and uh, Vishnu from Tower 7. These are in the National Museum. As you can see, the fluid, slightly sinuous and slender form that was adopted in the 7th century has given way to something far more hieratic and far more expressive of power and it probably reflects the growing imperial uh, approach to ruling that the Khmer kings uh, were espousing. As well as uh, temple mountains, the Khmer were given to ancestor temple construction. And more or less the same time, originally they thought it was earlier, but now it seems clear from recent French research that in fact this follows the temple mountain of Bakong, is the ancestor cluster of six temples at Pre Ko, the front row of three uh, housing male gods and dedicated to male ancestors uh, of the king, and the rear row of three, slightly smaller, dedicated to female gods and ancestors. And here you see uh, Pre Ko, which is a dedication uh, date and inscriptions and uh, so forth, indicating that 879 of our era was the year that it was uh, uh, dedicated. Uh, in 889, the son of, uh, of Indravarman came to the throne, Yashovarman, and he was the one who actually definitively moved to the area we now think of as Angkor. He moved and created as his temple mountain, his state temple, the huge temple of uh, Bakong, which surmounts a natural hill overlooking uh, the central Angkor site. This had 108 temples surrounding the, the uh, structure and comprising uh, a mythical number of spiritual significance, uh, which can be seen from uh, Indian um, references, Indian literary references. You get a continuation of the urge to hieratic form. Its central tower, is flanked on the sub-cardinal sub uh, points of the upper platform by four subsidiary towers, forming a five-part summit, which then became very pervasive in Cambodia, known as a quincunx. And inside these, uh, these towers were, of course, uh, sacred sculptures, and in this case, almost all certainly of stone, some of which uh, have survived. Bakeng, uh, the, the, the male torso on the right, is quintessential style for Bakeng, the same kind of growing solidity and uh, power structure that you found uh, in the Roloos sculpture, but now with increased refinement of the detailing of, for example, the costume. The draped sampot worn by the male god is intricately pleated with a very elaborate fanning and um, feathering of the pleats of the uh, belt and also of the cloth as it was pulled up between the legs and down and over uh, and restrained by uh, sometimes two belts, uh, which according to the carving were highly jeweled. This is more or less contemporary uh, with um, a Maitreya, indicating that although the Vishnuite and Shaivite tendencies of these early 
Khmer kings were the chosen epitome of the gods they identified with. Buddhism continued to flourish uh, without any uh, hindrance, and Buddhistic sculpture, like this extremely beautiful Maitreya, which is in the exhibition upstairs, uh, were created at the same time. There was an aberration in the 10th century, the early 10th century. Uh, while his nephews were on the throne succeeding Yashovarman, a king who called himself Jayavarman IV decided to pronounce himself king of Cambodia. And he ruled from his estates at Chok Gargyar, which we now call Koker. He uh, ruled there from nine, 921 until 928 when the second nephew died and he became the undisputed ruler. There doesn't seem to have been any kind of struggle or overt uh, destructiveness. Like other times, this time was probably one where you could, in fact, have coexisting rulers. Not all of them, uh, however, claimed to be the chief king, but Jayavarman IV did, and everything at uh, Koker is more or less on steroids. It is the highest of all the temple mountains, this uh, central temple mountain at Koker, and without its top structure, long since disappeared, perhaps even that was made of precious metal like silver, without that, it's 35 meters high, and it is a terrifying climb. The ascent is only on one face, the, uh, which you see in front of you, uh, and a very rickety staircase is the only way to get up there, and you need strong nerves and don't look down. As I said, things were on steroids. Even the gate temple of Prasad Kraham, so-called because it's of red brick, very, very tall, contained an enormous figure of dancing Shiva, uh, who, one of whose hands you see here, this hand is uh, 60 centimeters uh, high, and there were, there, they've got five of them in the National Museum, so you get some idea of the colossal nature of the statuary as well as the temples. There are um, nearly 100 temples here, too. One of them is Prasat Nyankmao, which you see on the right, uh, made of laterite, which has turned that strange black color. And on the left, you see a sculpture in the National Museum of the wrestling ape kings, Valin and Sugriva, which is three meters tall. Uh, in spite of the enormous size of these sculptures, uh, this is a site that has been very badly looted. And I'm afraid many of the monumental sculptures are now decorating many of museums not in Cambodia, uh, including uh, some indeed, in this country. However, still, luckily, in situ is one of the most dramatic of all the Koker sculptures, the striding Garuda on the right-hand screen, which is more than two meters tall, and a very graceful pair of wrestlers that you see on the, uh, on the right, uh, which came from um, the second w gateway to the west of the main sculpture. King Yashovarman had established the capital and called it Yasho Darapura, what we now call Angkor. And indeed, most of the succeeding kings kept to that name. They did not rename the capital after themselves, which was fairly unusual. It was called Yasho Darapura in the literature for the next several centuries. But King Rajendra Varman brought the capital back there, and uh, he was a king who had a very successful reign with many victories against uh, neighboring countries and who was effulgently praised in the literature. His body was hard as a diamond. It was a game for him to cut an iron bar into three as if cleaving a banana tree. His voice was as deep as the depths of the ocean. And if the god of love wanted to see an image of himself, he had to do nothing but look in the mirror where uh, Yashua Varman, where uh, Rajendra Varman was gazing. Uh, this kind of effulgent praise is fairly typical for the uh, inscriptions that are found on the foundation stele, but it seems that Rajendra Varman was even a, a pretty important um, role model beyond the normal uh, courtesy. 
it's interesting, this reign, because Rajendra Varman was an ardent uh, Brahmanistic follower with Shiva as his designated patron god, but it was most preeminently a time of collaboration uh, with Buddhists. And one of his chief ministers uh, was a man called Kavindra Rimatana, who was one of the only named architects we can cite in all the history of great Khmer architecture. Kavindra Rimatana seems to have had a genius for architectural construction that combined exalted expression of towers reaching to heaven and temple mountains, at the same time embodying engineering principles that meant that the central structures of this Prerup, which was the state temple of Rajendravaman, and its Mebon, its subsidiary uh, temple built on an island in a in a reservoir called East Mebon, they have remained structurally intact in a way that reflects the understanding of the material. Prerup uh, was dedicated uh, in 961. And it was an era of sculpture of remarkable refinement. This is uh, a, a stone sculpture of Varuna, who was the guardian of the Western Ocean and often found in the west of a temple, uh, of his riding his, uh, his geese, his mounts. And uh, he is a typical of Prerup style, of enormously uh, naturalistic depiction of musculature uh, and of skin and of facial features. Jayavarman the fifth succeeded Rajendravarman in 966. And he is responsible, uh, his reign is responsible for the creation of one of the great gems, the small gems of Cambodian architecture, Bante Sre. Although it was not in fact built by him, but by a Brahman, who was the guru of Jayavarman's son, who then succeeded him uh, as king. It is on a very small scale, dedicated to Shiva, and is noted for its pink sandstone, very hard, so the details of the carvings have survived. These are the three sanctuary temples from the west, and uh, to the right you can see the outline of one of the great libra so-called libraries that face uh, the main temple sanctuary in almost all Cambodian uh, temples. The uh, decorative carving flanking the doorways uh, are Typical example is this Devata, a female guardian, with her graceful pose, which is a sort of archaizing. The sculptors were reverting to the expression and the forms of the great 7th century work uh, that preceded and was uh, then followed by that rather rigid hieratic sculpture uh, of the 9th century. Uh, at the turn of the uh, century, uh, Jayavarman died and probably left unfinished his temple mountain, which is called Takeo, extremely steep, uh, one of the steepest uh, angles of ascent, in fact, but it is again in that quincunx form. But it was completed later, perhaps by the king who succeeded him after some struggle and other competing monarchs, uh, who was the great Suryavarman I, the so-called Sun King, invoking the sun as Surya. It's possible that he himself was a Buddhist, but he did not uh, rock the boat uh, in terms of the state religion, and he subscribed uh, to the god Vishnu as the guardian of the empire. He certainly made alterations to the so-called royal chapel, the smallest of the temple mountains, it's called Pimeanakas, and it is within the grounds of the royal palace uh, in Siem Reap, uh, in the heart of what was to become Angkor. Uh, Takeo was around a thousand, and Pimeanakas, uh, probably on an existing structure, which is typical for most of the great temples, but it was certainly refined by Surya Varman, who seems not to have built his own temple mountain. It says a lot, I think, that he was more intent on solidifying his empire and pushing its boundaries than on glorifying himself. He did establish important temples on his peripheries, and in each of them he established a golden linga, a symbol of 
the royal power backed up by uh, the great power of the supreme god Shiva. Uh, it, the 11th century was an extraordinary era uh, in Cambodia as elsewhere. When you think about it, um, Lady Murasaki was writing the first novel in Japan. The first optics study was made by an Iraqi, Ibn al-Haytan. Leif Erikson landed in North America. The Cholas attacked Sri Vijaya in Sumatra. The Normans invaded England. The Chinese invented movable type and gunpowder and Gothic architecture began in Europe. It was quite a century. And the empire was um, clearly very homogeneous for the first time. And at the peripheries, as I said, he established important temples or extended existing temples. This is really the pattern. Every king tends to extend an existing structure to make it more uh, magnificent. Uh, he, this uh, is one of the most famous of all the Cambodian temples at the moment because it is a subject of great dispute between Cambodia and Thailand. It's the temple of Prewiher, which is perched on the escarpment of the Dang Re Range and uses the existing natural site to astonishing effect, as does Bat Pu in Laos, which was another one of Surya Varman's periphery markers, you might say where he also did extensive work. Uh, you climb and climb and climb at Prewihere, including up this very steep and somewhat perilous uh, staircase. Uh, you go through five magnificent gopuras, the lowest one of which you see on the left, and uh, gradually ascend to the summit where there is uh, a surrounding uh, colonnaded gallery space, as you see on the right and left of the right-hand image, and a uh, vestibule structure still intact, backed by an enormous pile of huge stones. The central tower of the central sanctuary, it seems very clear, was deliberately destroyed. But when? We don't know. And the idea of trying ever to reconstitute it is probably completely uh, out of the question. There was an overlap between the work of, of Surya Varman and his successor. But uh, the solidification of this site is truly an engineering miracle, as well as being an astonishing and breathtaking experience to visit. Here you can see how the natural hillside was in fact supported by terraced rows of stone, as is also the case at Batpu. Uh, monumental sandstone blocks arranged in that terraced form, uh, which allow you to see, go to the edge of the escarpment and see the breathtaking scenery that surrounds this uh, extraordinary site. 11th century had quite a pervasive uh, emphasis of Vishnu as distinct from Shiva. And at the site of Kabalspean, which is a river flowing up uh, in the Kulen Plateau area, you find that the riverbed, mostly in the 11th century, was carved with hundreds and hundreds of lingas, little round linga stones, which you see in the foreground of the right-hand image, and with yoni, the uh, female uh, receptacle for the powers of uh, Shiva, uh, also carved facing upstream so that the water gushes into them and flows down. This water then flows, reticulates, and feeds into the river, the Siem Reap River, that then flows to the temples of Angkor and fills its moats. So that the water in the moats of the temples of Siem Reap, of Angkor, is holy water because it has flowed over these uh, Shaivite and Vishnuite symbols. As for all the uh, lingas and yonis, there are also many carvings of Vishnu reclining in cosmic sleep, one of which you see here as the most egregious and horrendous of the vandalistic attempts to steal the sculpture. That rather nasty, uh, creamy stuff is a, an attempt to replace the original sandstone image. Uh, the uh, 11th century was most notable in the time of Uddaya Ditya Varman II, uh, who succeeded Surya Varman I, 
by uh, the great temple of Bapuan, erected around 1060. You see it here, uh, standing to the left of the causeway, an elevated causeway on columns that leads to its huge gateway. And behind it, you see rising uh, the central mound of uh, the, one of the most ambitious of the temple mountains. It's not so much that it's high, but it's very steep. And it turns out that they miscalculated the angle of ascent. And so even before that temple was completed, it was beginning uh, to fall. It's now being reconstructed by French engineers um, from the Eco Française. And here you see a reconstructed gallery. It was surrounded by galleries with carvings, which later became very important at Angkor Wat and at Bayonne. Uh, and they are, uh, as you can see, flanked on the one side by solid walls, on the other side by columns, um, which are protected by corbelled uh, roof structures. The temple is noted for its relief carving in a very lively, fluid style. Uh, you see examples on, on the right, narrative scenes, uh, quite complete and quite detailed, of extraordinary uh, vitality and uh, giving you lots of insights into emotion and uh, interchange between the subjects depicted. And in the middle, as you see him in the exhibition uh, upstairs, you have a, an image of Vishnu uh, showing very clearly in, uh, his uh, held attributes. It's in a beautiful condition, this, and it's one of the most uh, successful uh, depictions of Vishnu uh, in bronze that we know. Not perhaps, however, as, uh, as dramatic as another uh, Vishnu of the period, which I'll show you in a minute. I just want to give you a little background about the reconstruction of Bapuan, which was fated to be caught in the middle of 30 years of civic strike, strife in Cambodia. In about 1960, it was clear, after myriad attempts to repair the, the collapsing side, that this temple needed to undergo anastelosis, complete uh, pulling apart and putting together again with a solid core that wouldn't disintegrate, the way they reconstructed Borobudur in Java. So they meticulously dismantled it side by side. They laid out the stones, they numbered them all, and they kept very careful lists. But then ensued the civil war and the Khmer Rouge, and in those ensuing years, all the records were lost. So you had... Um, a third of a million stones lying in the ground and no guide to how to put them together again. However, uh, Jacques du Marseille, who'd been part of the dismantling team, was still alive and he remembered a lot. And they began, and with any luck, next year this restoration will be complete. A happy ending. The grace of the relief sculpture at uh, Bapuan is totally backed up by the three-dimensional sculpture we have in many media. On the right, you see the quintessential Bapuan style with a plunging skirt cloth, plunging down below the umbilicus, uh, gracefully clinging to the thighs and faring, flaring slightly, slightly at the bottom, uh, and the wonderful pleated depiction of the garments uh, as she stands there. Her stance is somewhat rigid, but the clinging of the garment gives this statue a sort of uh, grace that, uh, again, it reminds one of the earlier uh, Cambodian uh, achievements. Perhaps the most beautiful of all the images of the Buddha seated uh, on the coiled uh, naga. Here is the magnificent sculpture of Vishnu in reclining, reclining on the primordial ocean in cosmic sleep. Uh, this would have been um, six meters long when intact, and it was found in the well on the, in the temple on the artificial island of West Mebon in the middle of the West Barai, the enormous eight-kilometer-long artificial reservoir created by the Khmer in the 11th century. He was in a temple that presumably barely uh, was larger than himself because he was one of the greatest attempts at bronze structure ever made. Jayavarman VI built a lot of temples in what is now Thailand, 
he came from the Mahi Dharapura region to the north of the Dangrek range. He and his uh, brother ruled as kings, but it seems that they ruled from Thailand, although they were in fact consecrated in Angkor. So we have lots of architectural record of him, but not anything I'm going to show you today because it isn't in Cambodia. He was then succeeded by his great nephew after a lot of struggle. It was tremendous contention about the uh, power, power struggle and contention about the succession. And this was the great story of Amun II, who is most noted for the construction of Angkor Wat. Uh, I think there's one other country, but certainly Cambodia is the only country I can think of at the moment that has a building on its national flag. And this in uh, Queen Kong's form is perhaps one of the most perfect creations uh, of architectural religious expression that exists. It's certainly the world's largest religious monument. Suryavarman II was very bellicose. He fought endless wars with Champa. He hardly ever won, but he just kept doing it. However, he was a great uh, looker around, and he opened diplomatic relations with China, for example, for the first time since the ninth century. He was, as I said, however, a great builder. And this first half of the 12th century sculpture uh, gave rise to a whole wave of relief sculpture of extraordinary grace and beauty. And as you can see here, the pair of apsaras or, or heavenly celestial dancers uh, is flanked by one of the most beautiful bronzes in the exhibition upstairs, the kneeling woman who perhaps was holding a mirror or, or a screen of some kind, and bronzes of great grace and refinement like the standing adorned Buddha on the extreme right. On the left, unfortunately, you can hardly see him because he's so sacred that he's always coated with um, glorious garments and flowers and his feet are always covered with tributes. But this is a Vishnu sculpture, a huge Vishnu sculpture, which is in one of the outer chambers of Angkor Wat, which, uh, according to some, might have been the central image originally. But uh, Angkor was never abandoned. Angkor, Angkor Wat was never abandoned. And when uh, Cambodia became uh, uh, Theravadin Buddhist uh, in the 15th century, Angkor Wat became a Buddhist pilgrimage site, and therefore Lot, lots of Buddha sculpture was installed within the sculpture, and the central sanctuary uh, was dedicated to Buddha, and therefore this sculpture of Vishnu, if it was indeed the same one, would of course have been removed. It is the most uh, impressive um, piece of uh, statuary. And it is interesting example of the Khmer tolerance for many religion streams that here it is, an original Vishnu sculpture in a Brahministic temple, moved aside at some point in the, who knows when, 15th, 16th century, but still deeply revered by the Buddhist Khmer today, and the site of many important healing ceremonies and dedication ceremonies. Suryavarman uh, left the, we're not quite sure when he, uh, died, some of these things are always shrouded in mystery, but eventually, after many uh, usurpations and a horrendous invasion by Champa in 1177, uh, Jayavarman, who was a prince, returned from Champa and threw out the charms and retook the capital at Angkor. Uh, and he became king uh, officially in 1181. And he created a Buddhist empire. For the first time, Buddhism was the official state religion. It was Mahayana Buddhism, not the Theravada Buddhism, which pervades Cambodia today. And the heartland of his temple was his state temple of Bayon. Bayon, surely the most enigmatic of the world's amazing religious structures. We really don't know all the details, although a lot of very valuable research is being done at the moment, most notably by Olivier Cunin, who will be giving a lecture here later on. His PhD thesis is all about um, the Bayon. It was finished around about, well, we're not sure when it was finished, but it was begun in the last quarter of the 12th century and probably wasn't completed until early in the 13th century. And it comprises many clustered uh, face towers uh, that are a source, a continuing source, and always will be, 
of uh, scholarly dispute. The identity of the faces in the towers is hotly debated. Uh, is it the king himself? Is it Avalokiteshvara? Is it Brahma? Uh, we don't know. Various travelers in the early days thought it was the Buddha himself. We simply can't answer the question, but it is a source of great uh, mystery. And this was the period when bronze uh, statuary became a little less refined, but you still got the refinement of this Hevajra shrine, which is in the exhibition, showing the great uh, vitality and dynamism of uh, the bronze art of that period. And these sorts of images would have been carried into the small chapels. The Bayon comprises dozens and dozens of small chapels and small sub-temples at the feet of the towers, and all kinds of religious structures that were involved with family, uh, ancestor worship perhaps, as well as worship to many, many gods, which inscriptions make clear uh, was the case. As you see, these faces are calm, noble, enigmatic, and uh, will always be one of the most fascinating things to look at uh, in Cambodia. Uh, on the right, also in the exhibition, a very typical structure. Hundreds of these sculptures, perhaps almost certainly thousands of them were made, showing the Buddha at the center of a triad, flanked on his right by Avalokiteshvara, or Lokeshvara, uh, the god of the Bodhisattva of compassion, and on his left by Prajna Paramita, the epitome of ultimate wisdom. So you have a combination of compassion and wisdom, which is the theme much explored by the literature of Jayavarman the seventh uh, in his uh, inscriptions, and also in the statuary that he distributed uh, throughout his kingdom. At the same time, Brahmanistic images flourished. You had Ganesha, these are both in the exhibition of upstairs. You had Ganesha, who has been totally adopted into the Buddhist canon, as well as being uh, originally uh, Brahmanistic. And you have the bull Nandin, who is Shiva's mount, uh, the vehicle of, of Shiva, a very beautiful, lively, endearingly uh, realistic uh, depiction of a young bull. There were two temples that preceded the Bayon that were perhaps temporary uh, headquarters, as it were, for Jayavarman's administration. Most notably, Prayak Khan, dedicated to Lokeshvara and to the king's father. And here you have a mysterious two-storied structure that we can't explain. We don't know what it is, but it is one of the most interesting uh, structures of the many dozens of temples that sit within the Prayer Khan uh, precinct. Like Angkor Wat, uh, all the temples of the Bayon era are engraved with extraordinary relief sculptures, including the same kinds of apsaras or devatas that are so famous at Angkor Wat. The one on the uh, right is a rather endearing image. Uh, she's holding a mirror and gazing at herself. It's a rather nice humanistic touch. Taprom is the other preliminary temple. This was dedicated to his mother, the king's mother, and Prajnaparamita, and statues that are perhaps from the heartland, or the central sanctuary of that temple, are now uh, what the one, the most important one, is now in Musée Guimet in Paris. But Taprom is, of course, the ultimate destination for the photographer because it is the temple where the trees have invaded on a scale that is uh, really very special and dramatic. And in many cases, the tree has become the armature of the temple. And removing it would perhaps precipitate a total collapse. Uh, sometimes, however, you have to do it because if you don't, the wind will blow the tree down and the temple will then be totally destroyed. So there's a lot of protest in Cambodia at the moment about the fact that the Indian archaeological team is indeed removing many of the Taprom trees. But people should understand that one day, sooner or later, if they don't, the tree will fall down. And that will entail far more destruction than the systematic and careful pruning and trimming that uh, is going on at the moment. 
The Bayonne era was a remarkable era for pilgrimage. And by, uh, Jayavarman established uh, chapels and hospitals and uh, shelters for pilgrims along the long royal road that ran into what is now Thailand in Pimai, where thousands of pilgrims made the procession from Pimai to the heartland of the Buddhist kingdom at Bayon. And this kind of philosophy, uh, often quoted about Jayavarman, who felt the sufferings of his people more than his own, gives the image of a king who was indeed determined uh, to practice the uh, philosophy of Buddhism. Uh, on the other hand, you could think of him as a megalomaniac narcissist because images of him uh, were dotted throughout the very large Khmer Empire, which by this time reached almost to the borders of Burma and comprised a great deal of modern Thailand, a big chunk of modern Laos, and from time to time, uh, took in the Champa area in central Vietnam, not to speak of the southern area of uh, Kampuchea Krom, the southern part of Cambodia, which is now also uh, Vietnam. So this was a huge extent, a huge empire, um, where constructions of temples like Bante Chmar were on a scale of staggering uh, ambition. Uh, it isn't quite clear how this could have been done because the rains were not as long as all that, uh, these temples, one would assume, would take 15, 20 years to build, and yet they all seem to be happening at the same time with astonishing need for labor and resources. And you supposing you've got 200 people building a temple, who's going to feed them, where are their family is going to be, where are you going to grow the food, and most importantly, especially in Bhante Chmar, where are you going to get the water? Because this is a dry area. So the physical challenges of the extraordinary architectural ambition of the Khmer kings is something that we can only wonder at and wonder whether this was in fact what made the empire in the end vulnerable to neighbors' um, incursions. And uh, here is the king who was responsible for this enormous outreach. This is a depiction, much less famous image than the one that uh, adorns many covers of catalogues. This is Jayavarman as an older king. But he still looks as if he's in beatitude mode. He's still got that slight smile, the downcast eyes of a meditating uh, devotee, the calm forehead, the beautifully rounded head, and the ushnisha, the contemplation, the spiritual bump on the head that characterizes the head of the Buddha himself. So the question remains unanswered. Was this a king of enormous dedication to the spiritual principles of Buddhism, or was he just one more uh, ambitious empire builder? Probably both. Thanks. <laughs>